This will surprise no one who listens to this show, but America is single. It's divorced, undercommitted, and hopelessly out of touch with how to build a relationship that lasts. Women in particular are groomed for a life centered on career and on being fiercely independent, as though marriage and family were a nice idea or a possible accompaniment to an otherwise satisfying life. But if flying solo is so great, why are online dating sites a billion dollar industry, replete with clients looking to get hitched? In my new book, How to Get Hitched and Stay Hitched, which is available now for pre-order, women get a much needed detox from the cultural narratives they've absorbed about men, sex, love, marriage, work, and family. Modern women don't need any more help in the professional sphere. They have that in spades. What they don't have is guidance in love and life. How to Get Hitched is not about finding a husband per se, but about how to map out a life that works in every sphere, including marriage and children. It offers women a new roadmap with specific countercultural guidelines that will help them be successful in this domain. How to Get Hitched is the antidote women need to reject the lies they've been fed by our culture. It's about what you really want versus what you've been told you should want and about what is true of men in marriage versus what you've been told is true. Get ready. This book will rock your world. Just go to howtogethitched.net and you'll find all the information you need there. Again, that's howtogethitched.net. And now on with the show. From the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week when we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. Are you one of the millions of men looking to hit the reset button on life? Are you fed up with your sexless marriage? Are you newly divorced and wondering where it all went wrong? Are you one of the millions of men who discovered your wife cheated on you? If you can relate to any of this, you're going to want to know about Dad Starting Over, also known as DSO. DSO is the pen name for Ralph, the founder of dadstartingover.com, host of the Dad Starting Over podcast, and author of three books, including his popular title, The Dead Bedroom Fix, which we're going to talk about today, big time. The Dad Starting Over website is a source for men who are starting over in life after divorce, after enduring a wife's affair, or for those men who are still married and want to hit the reset button on the relationship, find their place in life, and finally do things the right way. In 2020, Ralph started the DSO Fraternity, which is the members-only portion of dadstartingover.com. Members get access to fraternity articles, podcasts, all of the DSO books, members-only discussion forums, and live member meetings that take place three to four times a week. All of the member meetings are archived and available to listen via your podcast app. DSO Fraternity members also get big discounts on one-on-one coaching with any of the five DSO coaches. Listeners of the Suzanne Venker show can go to dadstartingover.com forward slash Venker, and you will get your first month of DSO fraternity membership for $1. Try it out to see if it's right for you because you can cancel at any time. Sorry, ladies, this group is for men only. Ralph has three children from his first marriage and a new one on the way with his second wife, Natalie. Welcome to the show, Ralph. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. It's so nice to uh, to talk with you after listening to your podcast a bunch of times. I think when you first got with me and I was on your show, then I looked your stuff up and I think I told you that I look, sort of binge listened to your podcast. Oh, your, good, uh, good. Podcast. I'm glad. And, Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I could see why why you had some people who mentioned me because we definitely overlap. There's just no oh, yeah. question about it mm-hmm. with our message. Okay, so before we get into what I really want to hone in on for this conversation, which is your book, The Dead Bedroom Fix, tell everybody a little bit about how DSO, the DSO fraternity came about and, and what it is. Well, the DSO fraternity is the members only portion of my website, and the website is dadstartingover.com. And if you are a member of the DSO fraternity, uh, there are some benefits, obviously. It costs $14.99 per month or $149 for the year. And you uh, get some members only articles, you have members only podcasts, the the big draw for a lot of guys are discussion groups that are active 24 seven. 
And a lot of guys don't have a lot of people to talk to about this relationship y stuff. And we get guys from all over the world to get on discussion groups and talk. And then we have guys, uh, we have, I have four guys that work for me that act as what we call uh, coaches and meeting hosts. And they host meetings three to four times every single week live on Zoom. And we have guys from all over the world get together and talk about a variety of different topics. And so we're having, you know, literally, we have literally hundreds of meetings that are archived that you can listen to. Each of them are an hour or more. I have dozens of podcasts you can listen to. Uh, articles and you get access to all my books as well. You can download them or listen to the audio book. So that's been uh, really big right now. We have just over 700 guys from around the world that are, that have joined. And they've all, and what they have in common is sort of, and we're going to get to your story in a little Mm -hmm. bit here, that what they all have in common is some presumably marriage, right? Or relationship that failed um, or that they struggle with. Yes. And and, yeah. Is that some of it or is there more? It's really, the term starting over could mean the obvious, which is I'm divorced. Now, what do I do? Or it could be, I just kind of had a grand epiphany in the middle of my marriage and said, man, I've been a shitty husband or wow. Our marriage has been shitty for a variety of reasons. What can I do to kind of improve this? And the majority of guys find me via the book called the dead bedroom fix, which we're going to talk about. And because as you well know, um, an acute pain point for men is the not so good sex life after they get married and after kids come along more specifically. And, no question. and so they reach out for help and they scour the internet searching for, is my wife asexual? Does my wife not find me attractive anymore? Is my wife cheating? All kinds of stuff. And they find my website, read the book, get on Amazon, audible, whatever it may be. And they come to the website and join the group. I always tell people that when I get these, uh, you know, when I, when people first reach out to me, they have to fill out this intake form that asks, you know, what is, what are the struggles or frustrations in your marriage relationship and what do you want to be different? And for women, I get long paragraphs (laughs) describing everything you can imagine. And then the ones I get from the husbands are all the same as you might guess what that is. Mm. Very short, and very sweet. We don't have sex. Yeah. Or we don't have enough sex. Well, you know, and what's like sex or whatever. And what's funny is that's the most obvious, you know, there's a joke. What do men need? We need uh, food, peace, quiet, silence, food, and then sex. And then when I drill down to the guys and I said, okay, then if your wife told you, all right, fine. Once a week, you know, maybe they went to marriage counseling and the marriage counselor said, what would make you happy, Mr. Husband? He said, well, sex once a week would be amazing. And the wife rolls her eyes and says, fine sex once a week. A lot of guys go, no, I don't want fine sex. And you you used to lay there like a mannequin. No, that's horrible and horrendous. So then I asked the guy, okay, then let's drill down further. What is it exactly you want? And what these guys want is validation and connection. That's what they want. They want somebody that makes them feel amazing. And they want to look across the table and say, that person really loves me and wants me. Yes, at a carnal sexual level, but also just wants to connect emotionally with me. And a lot of women, you know, I, these stories that I hear, just they really drop the ball on that. And when I um, try to explain that to women, sort of giving them, giving them a visual or something really quickly that they can get their minds around, I say, just tell me what it was like when you were first married. Mm. Just think about it, okay? Yeah. Pre-kid or even right before you were married, whatever, just right when the relationship was still in its infancy, I want you to think about what you were doing, both of you, what you brought to the table, what that sex looked like, mm-hmm. and that is essentially what they want. And you, what does it look like compared yes. to today? And that's a real easy visual, right? Yeah. You women are fine-tuned, validating machines at the very early stages of the relationship. You know what makes us tick. You know what buttons to push to make us say, yes, I will be your boyfriend. And part of that validation is the physical, obviously. And part of that is the emotional. Oh, you like old cars, so do I. Um, Oh, you like that band? I could like that band too, sure. I'll go to a concert with you. And then we notice as the relationship moves on and on and on, you just naturally, you just don't get validated that much. And the ultimate expression of not getting validated enough is um, the sex dries up. And a lot, and boy, I don't think women and to your credit, you're, I hear in your podcast and so forth, you're really pushing this, but a lot of women do not understand just how much of a mind F that is for men. Mm-hmm. To, to the woman that I love more than anything in the world, 
if she was being very honest, would say, yeah, I just don't have those feelings anymore. Not nearly to the degree that you have and not under these circumstances with kids and marriage and stress and everything. No, it's just not happening. And men and are I just crushed by that. The, the, the couples will, or the husband specifically will say, well, my husband is just, I mean, excuse me, my wife is just flat out said, well, we're not doing that anymore. Yeah. But that's right. not us anymore. Sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> like that's okay. Well, but what but what is she saying with that? And I, a lot of men I talk to flat out hear that from their women. And I said, what she's saying, well, what you going to do about it? Okay, now I want to stop right there because that's yeah. what I want to focus on. So you obviously really are focused on men and how they can change mm. or what they can do to improve their marriages. I'm obviously focused on what women can do mm -hmm. to improve their marriages. And that's obvious. You're a man, I'm a woman, and I think... It just wouldn't work to reverse that too well. <laughs> um, so, but let's, I want to spend this time focused on you and, and the other side of the equation of, from what I do. Um, and, and I love how in the beginning of your book, the dead bedroom fix, and let's go ahead and get into that. Mm -hmm. you, you have like a two page thing for women. <laughs> <laughs> totally different ball game. That up? It was pretty yeah. funny. Yes. Yes. You're like this book isn't for you or yes. this is for men, but here real quickly. Yeah. What, what, what do you need? To, if you if you're having this problem, what can you do on your end? And, you know, it's funny that I kind of belittle it. But after I wrote that book, which I wrote, by the way, like four years ago, and then I came out with an updated version in 2020, I realized it's a much bigger, more insidious problem than what I thought, where a lot of women are saying, um, I would actually like to have sex. And my husband says no. And from what I have determined from a lot, of, a lot of it has to do with uh, pornography. Uh, yeah. A lot of men have really bad porn habits. And there's also a hormonal component. A lot of men are completely ignorant about once you get 40 years plus, the old testosterone just starts going down a little bit. And it's kind of shameful to a lot of men. They don't want to talk about it. Um, so those are the two big things that I hear from a lot of women. But um, in general, in the book, I basically say, yes, looks matter. You know, I'm sorry, woman, if you've gained 50 pounds after the child, kind of a big deal. Um, be more feminine, be more agreeable less contentious, less nagging. And so for all these things really make a huge difference. Yeah. And yes, women, you can turn a man off to the point where he says, I don't know. The last thing I want to do is be intimate with you right now. It happens. Uh, it's, so that's, so that's, so that's just your quick sort of, and that's it. Ladies women, have and immediately get to, okay, but yes. this is for men, heterosexual men who are married or in a long-term relationship. Yeah. And then seven chapters later, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we get to so the bottom so of it. So let's get yeah. into it. So let's begin Ralph, with what the definition of a dead bedroom is, even though it's kind of obvious, I'll still let you describe it. And then we're going to talk about what causes it. Well, it's a pretty subjective thing, really, isn't it? I mean, I've, I have spoken to men, and it's rare. Well, I will sit down and say, uh, you, you found me via the book, I assume. Yes. Well, tell me what's going on. He's like, man, we used to do it every single day, multiple times a day. I'm like, well, wow, that's what about now? Maybe once or twice a week. And I say, like, I, I, I'm sorry, I, you know, you're well in the top whatever percent of men that I talk to. This yeah, To me, definitely. objectively, in my mind, I'm like, high five, dude, congrats. And he's like, no, it's to me, that's a dead bedroom. All right. I think that guy's in the minority. But basically, um, you're not connected anymore. Sex has dwindled down to next to nothing. And um, she, in, in this book's narrative, is that, and boy, she really doesn't seem to be bothered by that. And the man really is. And this is something that I'm sorry to say, probably the majority of married men can relate to. And it just seems to be the, unless you actively grab a hold of the steering wheel and try to course correct, this is the default where marriage leads to for the majority of people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, oh, okay, we have so much to talk about. So first of all, before we get into the causes of it, um, I, I wrote something here that you, that you, from your book, that is very important, and that is this, quote, a lack of sex in a romantic relationship is indicative of a much deeper, uh, is indicative of much deeper issues that proliferate beyond the bedroom. It's a sign of a broken marriage. You may still be a married couple, but you're no longer in a romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. So, This is a tough one. I sort of said to people at the beginning that this is going to be a hard episode to listen to because mm -hmm. it's very personal and there's so much to say about it. Um, and everyone's story is different, but the reality is so, so both my husband and I have experience with, so his dad, his parents divorced, you could say over a dead bedroom, right? And my dad's first 
marriage before he met my mom and married her was a res that divorce was a result of a dead bedroom and back in those days you didn't say anything more but the, just that all you had to say was well she didn't have sex with me so that's the end of the you know that was it which okay that was like they needed something tangible mm -hmm. to say okay that's legitimate kind of thing but the reality is exactly as you wrote here is that it's indicative of much deeper problems it really isn't about the sex at all even mm -hmm. though it is yeah. right yeah Explain. that's just the that's just the canary in the coal mine that finally makes them go uh oh something's up here and inevitably, when I talk to these men and we drill down, I mean, it is almost 10 out of 10, 100% of the time, boy, we can really trace back issues very early on in the relationship mm -hmm. and even pre-relationship stuff. My mom and dad had a horrible, this is the guys talking, my mom and dad had a horrible relationship, very unloving and so forth. Dad left and ran off with some floozy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, her mom and dad split up and so they didn't really have very good um, role models for how to stay connected romantically sexually as a couple and then they get together and there's usually some guys are so sex is so important to us that some men can go yeah i can literally point to an incident where things started going downhill physically and a lot of the times it's i lost my job six years ago um, she lost respect for me. I couldn't get another job for six months. We were, we got so bad. We had to borrow money from mom and dad, et cetera, et cetera. So respect is very big for women. Definitely. After that hit, we never quite recovered. Um, unfortunately for a lot of people, it's once kids came into the picture, she went into mom mode and never escaped. And, um, he did, he had zero clue, zero tools, zero people to fall back on to say, We've, I'm kind of losing connection with my wife. What do I do here? And I, that's basically what the book is, is kind of the, uh, that paternal figure that a lot of guys unfortunately don't have growing up, the person to put the arm around them and say, it's all right. It's, this is a very common thing you're going through here and here's what you need to do. A Absolutely. lot of guys do not have that whatsoever in their life. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. And that's where this book yeah, that's that's the hole that it fills, right? That's the, that in in that yeah. in that whole that whole concept of putting the arm around the guy, saying it's all right, and we, we've been there, done that, and here's what you do. That that's basically the crux of DadStartingOver.com and the, the group that I started with the with the DSO fraternity. Um, it's just a lot of guys need that little helping hand, and they just yeah. do not have it. And so tell us your story because you learned this the hard way yourself. Oh yeah, so uh, almost a decade ago now. I was married, three kids, the youngest being one year of age, just over one year of age. And uh, while on vacation in sunny Florida with my family, uh, make a long story short, I discovered that my then wife was having an extramarital affair. And that really opened, appealed the scab back, you know, on myself and my emotional, oh, whatever, baggage. And I didn't cope very well with it at all. And it was a very traumatic event for me. Went to friends, went to family, went to counseling. Um, one of the things uh, from my past that I loved to do was write. So I would journal and get online and talk to other guys who did the same, who'd been through the same thing, which I discovered was like a bazillion guys going through the same thing. And there's forums dedicated to it and everything else. And um, I started writing on, oh, infidelity and my thoughts on the matter. And then, you know, a couple, three years go by. And like a lot of men, I, but my, your ego grows and you consider yourself an expert and you're giving advice to men. And eventually, you know, you're talking to men on the phone or via email or whatever. And they're saying, you know, you should charge for this. Yeah. Um, or I write on, Hey, what's with sex and marriage and some articles on that. And the guy said, you should write a book on this because this is huge. There's nobody's done a book on. And so that's what started. Well, let me write a book back in 2017. Let me start a website. Let me, a blog. And it's all just kind of snowballed from there. That's that's about a you know about a decade condensed right there. But there's a lot yeah. a lot of detail in there. But there's a lot of there was a lot of growing pains. Um, one of the saddest elements of my divorce and everything was not just I in, endured infidelity and the betrayal and all that nonsense, but it was their mother also went through a lot of people call it a midlife crisis, whatever you want to call it, where she became kind of emotionally detached for several years there from the kids. So they were without a maternal figure. Their dad was going through with whatever he was going through. Very, very stressful time. And uh, that was really tough. And 
I talk to a lot of men pretty much on a daily basis that are going through much the same thing, um, which is a whole other podcast in itself. They, they have a term for it called the walk away wife syndrome. Mm. Uh, that's how common it is. So, you know, overburdened, no coping skills, bad, bad childhood baggage women that just at some point go, I'm out. And that was my ex. To her credit, she's gotten better over the last several years. She's way more involved in the kid's life. And I really, I can't complain about her involvement. She's been doing a wonderful job of helping out in a lot of ways. But um, there, that wasn't without its consequences, that little time period where she was separated from the children emotionally and physically. Uh, my daughter, who is now almost out of high school, um, went through some pretty tough time. She became suicidal, yeah. um, self-harm, the whole nine yards. We had to get her some really big help with that, but she's gotten over it. But that was, um, yeah, that was tough. That's so my story. So you didn't just, this was after you got divorced that she just sort of left, you mean? Or <laughs> yeah. she left before? Okay. Yeah. A after, um, well, when it was, when the affair was discovered, it was basically to her, the impression was, oh, thank goodness. Now I can stop living in secrecy and I can go to plan B over here. Okay. And plan B involved not a lot of the kids. Unfortunately. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, okay. That is, that's a whole other podcast too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So let's get into, cause a lot of people who are listening to this are either experiencing it <clears throat> or know somebody who is, I want to, I'll first say about your book that it's very, it's just really well done in that it's not like, the books of 10 years ago. I love how you have everything. You have paragraphs for everything. That's really smart. <laughs> it really helps to read yes. where you have like one par one sentence or two sentence or three sentence paragraphs. So that, that's good. And you get right to the point. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's just well done. So when you talk about this, you're talking directly to the husband. That's what I'm hearing when I'm reading this mm -hmm. as, as a woman. Um, you start out, the no bullshit truth. Your wife isn't attracted to you. Yes. If she was, you would know it. Yada, yada. So you go on with that. So I have a couple of things from this um, paragraph or this page or two that I'm going to read. Okay. And okay, just, please. Go. Instead of asking, why am I dead? Why am I in a dead bedroom? You should ask, why is my wife no longer sexually attracted to me? That's when you start to get down to the actual cause of your problem. The dead bedroom is most likely the result of a series of negative actions or inactions on the part of the man. The man was presented with all the typical obstacles that get in the way of sex, kids, stress, time, familiarity, etc., and he didn't respond in the correct way. These actions and inactions over the years have never, sorry, never properly pushed the buttons his wife needed pushed to activate her sex drive. You did X and you got Y in return. It's that simple. So tell people if you can, in, in the simplest way you can, I guess, why it is on his, why it is on him to, um, to recognize that if the sex went bad, it's, it's, it's something that he did or didn't do. Yeah. And let me clarify, it's not 100% his fault. And, um, and I go further into the book about some issues such as what if she has, Oh, personality disorders yeah. and so yes, forth or anything else yeah. that's it, it, uh, there's nothing you can do just walk away type of thing but uh for the, a lot of men i talk yeah, to me. let me just i want yes. to read one more thing that kind yeah, of please. speaks to that so everybody's clear you said you either erroneously stayed with the absolute worst partner imaginable and i suppose somebody yeah. like that would be an example or you married a really good woman who naturally responded to her husband's mistakes in a very predictable way mm. she lost attraction to him yeah. And so, well, this kind of, the crux of all of this is a little disturbing, maybe it's a, too strong a word. It's bothersome to a lot of men, which is there's a natural order to things in relationships. And I know being a conservative woman, this is right up your alley, which is there's a polarization. And part of the polarization, the yin and yang, the masculine, feminine, whatever you want to call it, is um, somebody kind of has to lead in the romance department. And if you're going to sit back and just say, being a lover, it's not really in my wheelhouse anymore because I'm now a dad. Um, I'm now a husband and all that lover stuff. That was for when we were dating. 
That's for when you're trying to find a woman. That's when you're dating around and trying to impress all the ladies. Now that you're settling down, as they say, do I really need to concentrate on that stuff? Maybe every once in a blue moon when it's her birthday, Mother's Day or something, I'll try and woo her and take her out to Applebee's or something like that. Other than that, (laughs) there's really not much to... I, I can't tell you how many guys quite literally think that's the playbook for being a husband. There you go. Done. Um, a lot of them, to, a lot of these men, to their credit, though, are what we call super providers. And I know that's opposite from what you, you talk to a lot of the alpha female types that are very much, you know, high earners and so forth. But a lot of the guys I talk to are, I make very good high six figures. We have two condos. I, she, she's, I leased her a Mercedes on and on and on. And they also think that that's checking boxes and earns them points. And well, that should activate her have sex with, (laughs) have sex with my husband, you know, programming, but man, it sure isn't doing it. It's like, no, there's, there's a whole lot more to it than that. Um, and this book, if there's a criticism of this book and my work in particular is, man, you put a lot of, uh, on the shoulders of men. Like I get the same thing about them. Yeah. It's like, what about them? What about the women? I was like, well, here's, here's the thing. You can only control you man reading my book you can't control the other person so you've tried controlling her all these times and it ain't freaking working is it you've tried say can we go to counseling maybe uh, i can't tell you many guys go to their women and say uh, maybe you need to go to the doctor maybe it's your hormones and while well, the women really take that well yeah, maybe there's something physically wrong with you that you need <clears throat> meanwhile has he done anything in the in the catalog of things that a man can do to be more of a lover, has he done any of them? No, other than taking her to Applebee's, you know, last weekend. He thinks that's enough, or buying her the Mercedes. No, he hasn't done anything. So he jumps right from A to well, it must be something physically wrong with you. Otherwise, how can she not want me as a wife? It's ridiculous. So um, I guess the short answer is you men listening to this and potential readers of the book, you haven't, <clears throat> you probably haven't exhausted anywhere near the possibilities for activating your wife's sexual desire anywhere close to what you think you have. And I have a lot of women that email me saying, hallelujah, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. And um, it kind of goes a whole other can of worms. But to those women who say, what should I say to my man? Because I read your book. I know it's not for me, but I read it. And I would like to give it to him and tell him to follow this. What should I do? (laughs) Yeah. So <laughs> what, yeah. should, what should I do? And I say he's a man. The whole subtlety and nuance and hinting, it doesn't work. Blunt hit him over the head literally with the book saying, hey, dummy, read this. That works. Or look, <clears throat> um, this what we're doing now ain't cutting it for me. Here's what I like. That works. I'd be surprised. How many, yeah, the male ego can be fragile at times. And he may say, geez, that's kind of hits below the belt. But it probably changed too. And if he doesn't, well, it kind of says it all, doesn't it? Yeah. I like what you were saying about how, well, you phrased it. You rephrased it that men operate with a non-existent book of rules. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That when they get married, they think this mystery book, you call it, is supposed to like, if you do all these things, you'll get what you ultimately want sexually from your, yes. from your woman, which does not work at all. So that's why it's a fake book. But anyway, buy her gifts, do more chores, happy wife, happy life, pretend no other women exist and talk to her a lot. So we're not going to go into all of those because I want to get <laughs> to more of the solutions. But um, basically you said, in theory, they sound great. You're more giving, you're a better housekeeper, you're more agreeable, you're open with your feelings. What's not to like? But what's funny is that every, well, it's not funny, but is that every one of these are the exact opposite of what men should do when the sex goes south. In fact, they're they're continuation and amplification of what caused your dead bedroom in the first place. Mm -hmm. So basically, the script that they're working with from wherever it came, right, whether it's from their family growing up, whether it's from society, whether they saw it on TV, whatever it is, it's so unfortunate because they think they're doing everything right. Mm -hmm. And I always say, once again, like I said earlier, imagine what you did to get her in the first place. What did you have to look like? What did you have to do? What were your behaviors? Mm -hmm. What was your, what what did you, how did you dress? Were you fit? Were you like all of those things that got her, they will still get her. Yeah. 
right? I mean, assuming the marriage hasn't really gone down a really bad path. So, it, so this this going into dad provider housekeeper mode, it, it's a it's great for a husband, right? But it's just not going to do anything for the bedroom, mm -hmm. and it's just an unfortunate reality. I mean, I wish it could be that way, but I like the way you describe it in the book, where you're basically talking about evolution and how desire and innate primal desire urges work and that all that other stuff is just almost separate from it it just doesn't even relate even though you see stuff in the um media saying the more um chores men do the more sex they have and you're like no 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 no, no. <laughs> it's the same media that says women are crazy about the pillowy slightly overweight dad bod types Meanwhile, every lover Hollywood guy is he's not a he's not a bodybuilder type. We don't want to go that far into the, you know, balloon gross looking bodybuilder thing, but they're fit and they're masculine, yeah. fit yeah. and masculine, a, a lean, mean fighting machine. Um, every romance novel ever written, if you look at the cover, it's a, it's a strong masculine right. type. Um, so yeah, it, it's what you described and what we do in the early stages in the in dating phase is what I call the mating game. Please be my partner. Please, you know, pair up with me, pair bond with me. And we both put on the, the act. Yeah. And guess what, guys? You got to kind of keep the act up. Even though you snagged them and you won the prize and you got some kids to go with it and a lot of bills and everything else, you still got to play the game. Absolutely. And of course, I would say this, this is one, this is gender uh, neutral, I guess. Yeah. That's not a phrase you'll hear me say very often, but this is in that case, for sure. Um, women need to do the same thing. I mean, it's just a matter of, look, if you want to spend decades with the same person, which you can do in a, a congenially, you know, you can do it, but the bedroom part, if you want that part, that requires effort. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about what all these five mistakes have in common. And you write that they are all from the typical, quote, nice guy book of rules. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Well... There, there was a book, and I don't know if you've interviewed him or not. There's a gentleman I by have. the Dr. Robert Glover. Yes. Yes. No more, Mr. no more Mr. Nice Guy. I recommend it to the vast majority of guys I talk to because that book, the crux of it is basically um, learn to have boundaries. And uh, masculinity is okay. And a lot of men, the, a lot of men when trying to, well, let me resolve this problem go to a default book of rules that they think is not very contentious. It's nice. It's not ruffling any feathers. Hell, who doesn't like somebody who mops the floor and buys them a diamond necklace and, and so forth. And they're completely negating the other side of the equation, the, the mating side. And, and this is perfectly illustrated by, we all know some guy who is like the quintessential lover guy who just has girlfriends, like a conga line of women is what, he may not necessarily be the most mentally stable human being in the world, but he has something that makes women go, ah. Um, and more often than not, that guy's kind of a loser. Like he's not necessarily driving up in the Mercedes and so forth. He could be living with his parents and he could be playing in a band on the weekends or something, but there's something, he's got a certain something about him. And no matter how successful a guy may be or how much of a super provider he may be, we all want to secretly be that guy because he's got that little secret sauce mm -hmm. that that's something. And so we just need to dip into that world a little bit more and figure out what's going on there. We don't want to go completely into that world and dump our wife and run off with the floozy and everything else. None of the guys I talk to want to get, want to do that. Yeah. Um, a lot of men do, unfortunately affairs are pretty common. Yeah. And I'm not painting men to be some kind of angels. Men cheat um, a lot. And women do too, of course. But um, yeah, so uh, before it's a balance we... balance then, isn't it? I can yeah. hear people going, well, how do you, like, how do I be that guy mixed with the good guy? You know, that, because all those things you described about being, you know, I mean, that is, that's a good mate, you know, for sure. And a good dad and you want, and women want that for sure. You want stability, you want dependability. You do want someone to help around the house sure. and all that stuff. And I suspect that men really struggle with maybe similar the way women do in their own way. Where's the sex part of me and the, you know, getting through the day in a really um, fair, uh, responsible way. I don't know if I said that properly. But yeah, I call it the, uh, the split between being a lover and provider. Yeah. 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 
And I think both genders could uh, need to learn that you have, you can't just, for whatever reason, we all jump, both of us jump into one side and just negate the other. The problem is then men. Just, you know, well, I have the answer as to why that is, Ralph, and you oh, won't disagree with me. Oh, please go ahead. Children. The children. Yes. Children. I mean, if they never entered the equation, come on. Yeah. Please. Yeah. It's children. Yeah. It's it, just too easy. It, it's it. Who doesn't love children, right? If you have them, you would murder for them. You, they're, yeah. they're the, they're everything in your world. But at the same time, I can't tell you how many marriages I know that have been flat out ruined by kids. It sounds absolutely. terrible to say, but it's absolutely well, true. I think that's what's happening with these gray marriage, gray divorces. Oh, as soon as the kids yeah. out there go, well, shoo, now we can, I can move on with the real life. Yeah, absolutely. Happens a lot. Yeah. Because they did put everything into the kids and forget about each other. Yeah. Um, so I like the way you described all of this. You said this, you're referring again to the programming in what makes desire, like what, what makes people hot for other people. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Or in this mm -hmm. case, you're talking about women being hot for men. And you said, this programming is not nice. It's not politically correct, but I don't care about your feelings. It doesn't take into consideration the last hundred years of progressive societal change. In evolutionary terms, that's a fraction of the blink of an eye. This programming doesn't care about your past 10 years of being a great dad and loving partner. The programming laughs at your nice guy behavior. So what is the programming, Ralph? The programming is what I'm referring to as your, oh, primordial must mate with worthy man programming that's deep inside it. And when your when your man is napping on the couch instead of going out and killing a saber toothed tiger and dragging it back to the cave, not very attractive. You look at him and go, ugh. And you kick the couch and you know, what are you doing? And he looks up at you like, what's wrong with you? And uh, I thought you were gonna meet with your friends and go out and do something. No, uh, they canceled. It's like, ugh. Um, when, he, you know, there are certain domestic things that yes, are quote attractive to your mate. Well, he's a really great dad. You know, he was helping him out with their homework. He was picking him up from school and I'm lucky to have a guy like him, but those don't necessarily hit the button that says, and I'm going to drag him into the bedroom. That's just two totally different worlds. And that's something that's very difficult for us to wrap our mind around. And that's what I mean about why once children come into the equation you go into this mode and, yes. and, and you just do it's cut, cut it gets cut off unless yeah. or until you activate it which is what you're really what we're talking about here right and you said these five mistakes are rooted in the belief that the sexual machine we have in us is inherently moral we think our wife has a choice of whether or not to be sexually aroused she doesn't yeah so don't be mad at her because she's not attracted to those behaviors or that look or whatever she doesn't she can't help it. Mm -hmm. and, and nothing is more of a turnoff than, yeah, but you should be turned on right now. So let's go. You know, shaming the woman into not feeling it in the moment yeah. is yeah. not and you so gave, good. You gave an example by turning around and saying, I don't care how feminine, and soft and sweet a 600 pound woman is or something. Yeah, like yeah. That. 900 pound woman with a beard is what I say. <laughs> yeah. No, no matter how much we connect at an intellectual level or how emotionally connected we are. And she could be like, wow, this woman's amazing and she's great. As soon as she says, you know, we should go on a date. I'll just be like, no, <laughs> it's, it's, I'm sorry, but it's not happening. It's I don't care how interesting you are. We can be great buddies. I'll hang out with you. But date. And you level? are no. very forthright, but gentle to in saying, look, these, these, um, I think I forget what your word you use, shallow, shallow things or whatever, more superficial things matter when it comes, when it comes to sexual desire, you're not saying it matters, you know, for a lifelong partner, but you're talking, correct me if I'm wrong, strictly sexual desires. Exactly. Those shallow things matter. Absolutely do. Yeah. It's what well, it you all, know, it all starts. It all starts the same way. Whoa. Who is that over there? That's what it all starts. <clears throat> El these days with the online everything you see the little picture of the guy or the gal and you just say well he looks cute enough let's let's get to know him a little bit but it's always that initial uh, he or she looks cute enough the shallow yeah yeah so yeah it matters it absolutely matters how you look how you present yourself your confidence everything it means everything in this whole mating game as we call it okay so let's get to how to fix it Fix the dead bedroom, that is, if you have one. You have five specific steps for men. We're going to go through them. So number one, um, 
is be her lover. This is all under be her. Oh, wait. No, the whole thing is under be her lover. Yeah. Right? Yeah. How to Five be more steps. of a lover. Yeah, you got it. Step one, go to the gym. Yes. Physicality, being more masculine. This, it sounds, you know, a lot of men, not a lot, a small portion of the men that reach out to me, read that chapter and throw the book down. And why? Because it's insulting to them. I shouldn't have to do this is what a lot of them say. How stupid. I'm a professor of whatever, of physics at some major university. I'm not a meathead. I don't, I'm not going to lift weights, run on a treadmill. That's kind of beneath me. If, if my wife is going to be more attracted to me because of some superficial, shallow physicality on my part, I don't want anything to do with this. And I get some angry emails to that, and they stop right there. It's step one of the book, but um, it's huge. It's, it, it, I can't tell you after I gained muscle and lost fat and became an overall more masculine man, that changed everything for me personally, how I, my confidence, how I carried myself, how I interacted with people. I was more open and more jovial, less anxiety. Anxiety just disappeared. And um, it, sure enough, I can't tell you how many women came up to me before becoming more physically attractive, came up to me and squeezed my arm or touched my chest or something, zero. After I gained, you know, 20 pounds of muscle or whatever, all the time. And it's, and it's, women are, women are shameless. <laughs> you don't, you don't have the societal shame of don't you dare go up to the opposite sex and just touch them. Men we're scared to death of that, but women, not so much. You know, I'll just have a random, you know, honk, honk on the arm or something like that. Um, I had some uncomfortable moments at the office in regards to this. I had, uh, when I used to work for a company, I had an older woman come up and lift up my shirt tail to see my butt because I had my what? shirt. Oh yeah. Um, oh, she got a little smack on the wrist for that one, but that is, um, not unusual. So that is in very basic terms showing I'm pushing some kind of button here. And it's not necessarily these women saying I would run off and, and have sex with you or have an affair with you or whatever. But what they're saying is thank you for pushing a button in me that, that shuts down some of these little social barriers and, and it makes me feel sexy and fun if just for a second. And so what if you brought that to the relationship? More, more confidence, a wife who just says, oh, look at that, that's my man over there. I'm sorry, but that can do nothing but help. And some men that I talk to say, I went to the gym for a few months, I lost so much weight, I've gained so much muscle. Um, and we talked about this the last time you and I chatted. Uh, my wife noticed another woman checking me out, and after that, it was game on. Yeah, that's one of those unfortunate realities that yes. we do, right? <laughs> yes. Women, and they, they love to want their man to be um, desired, and that makes well, them sure, more. Well, sure, sure. And, and you want to stick out from the crowd. Yeah. And what yeah. better way as a man to stick out from the crowd than being the guy who's not afraid to take his shirt off at the pool? That people go, whoa, who's that? What's wrong with that? I personally don't see anything wrong with that. I don't see there's anything shallow or beneath me to have muscle and, and look good. God forbid. Okay. Step two, go away. Yeah. <laughs> and wow. And this, I think, has um, men and women, boys and girls, don't do well with each other when we hang around each other all the time. Amen. Oh, my God. Get Amen. the hell away from each other. And go do something else. Have a mission of some kind outside of the marriage. And boy, this COVID thing just really put a magnifying glass on that because these men and women were on top of each other all the time. Yeah. And how interesting the whole COVID babies thing that they were waiting on didn't quite happen. Um, <laughs> men and women felt more detached than ever because they were on top of each other all the time, driving each other nuts. Uh, there's, it's a very real thing that a lot of people who have studied intersexual dynamics and, and dating and so forth is, and we all know it, the old playing hard to get. It works. It works. Of course it does. And can you introduce some of that into a marriage? Yeah. It's called being a healthy dude and getting the hell out of the house and doing your own thing. Not all the time, not 24 seven. And a lot of men interpret this in, a, in the new edition. Oh, I want to play golf every Saturday all day and be gone or whatever. That's yeah. something. Um, 
a lot of men interpret this as I'm going to leave and not tell my wife where I'm going and she'll freak out and wonder if I'm dead. I'm like, that, no, that's not healthy. <laughs> you're still married to the woman and you, you're still, you're still the father to her children. She's got to know at least you're alive, but you know, you don't need to, you know, there's an old, there's a lot of things that men do when playing the game and dating, you know, when the girl texts you, you don't text her back right that second and say, Hey, you've been waiting on your tech. No, you, you have other things to do and you go, Oh shoot, I missed a text from so-and-so. Hey, how you doing? That's far more attractive than just immediately right away. Hi, I was waiting on your text message. So some of that game introduce that into the marriage and it's be more scarce, be an independent individual that you have your own little thing and it's not everything revolves around the wife. It's very, very important. Very. Do you find that to be um, a, a common thing? Yeah, very, very much so. Men these days are very domesticated and they're very, um, oh. Well, I mean, I know that male spaces have disappeared. Yeah. And so the whole going out with the man or playing poker, like all that's gone. So for sure. Yeah. But just, yeah, I see what you mean. You're, that is what you mean, really. Yeah. Right? It, 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 well, a lot of men have been sold on and there's nothing inherently wrong with throwing ourselves into the dad box 100% which is I'm coaching soccer, I'm helping out with this, I'm helping out with that, and that, that means I'm hanging around with the wife a lot. Yeah. Like all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, you can be more independent, have your own thing going on. I wish my husband were less independent. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes laugh that he'd be just fine if I just disappeared for a week and wouldn't even notice I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number three, step three, be unique. That kind of goes to number one with the gym thing, but if you blend in with the crowd, and boy, men love to do this. I can't tell you how many men I know that golf and how many men I know that, what hobbies do you have? I make my own beer. I don't know what it is with making their own beer and golfing. Men all think, well, that's just what I do. That's the, uh, the men you have been given as a man. Are any of them artists? No. Musicians? Maybe one or two, but uh, do any of them have some kind of mission outside of the life, something that takes up their time outside of job and kids and so forth. I don't know what that may be, some charity thing or whatever it may be. A lot of men just say, no, nothing makes them a unique individual. And to a lot of women, you know, I, I'm that, you know, I put in the book, uh, I'm dating so-and-so. Well, tell me about them. They will jump right into what makes them a really unique individual. Not he, he's a salesman for a, uh, uh, an insurance company and, um, uh, uh, he, he golfs every Saturday and so forth because she knows that her friends will just say, yeah, it sounds like every other guy I've ever met. They will jump to something that makes them a little unique because that's attractive. That means I'm able to snag somebody a little special. And that's important yeah. to a lot of women. Step four, and right in my wheelhouse, so, so you must lead and set the tone of the relationship. Yeah. And I want, but before you explain this, I want to say... Um, some people have been confused because I often talk about how women are the relationship navigators. Mm -hmm. And really what I'm talking about is when you're, when you're doing the mating dance, like at the beginning, they, they will set the standards for what a man will and won't do. They'll go high. If you, if your standards are high, they go high. If you go, if you go low, they'll go low. That's the kind of thing that I mean. And then also if you're married, because men are natural responders of women, if you're happy, they're happy. And if you're not, they'll want, they'll be sad for you and want to fix it kind of thing. Like mm -hmm. that's just part of the dance. So they're confused sometimes if I say women are navigators, they're confused when I simultaneously say, but men need to be the leaders. Well, women are the <laughs> natural, sense, but I think it's hard to women explain. naturally run the logistics of the relationship. This is where we're going. This is what we're doing. I, I found a couch to buy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, men just have zero interest in that kind of stuff. Yes. But in, yeah. ter in terms of the book, I meant setting the tone tone in terms of the romance and sexuality. Um, my wife and I, for example, are very touchy feely and very loving to each other where, you know, the little butt slaps, the little kiss on yep. the back of the neck, the, all that kind of stuff is, that's just part of what we do. And I, I pat on my back. I'm a big reason why, because that's just how I am. I'm a very touchy feely kind of guy. So that's what I do. And I set that tone. That's what kind of relationship this is going to be. It's going to be a lovey, touchy, sweet, and yes, sexy relationship. Um, a lot of men introduce zero of that throughout the day, their normal day-to-day -day existence. And then after putting the kids down to bed and they're exhausted, it's 1030 at night, they'll lie down and plop next to their wife in bed and 
offer her a massage and wonder how come she doesn't want to have sex. It's like, well, there was no lead up. There was no tone. There was no foundation set through the last days, years. What do you expect? So that's what I mean by that. You need to do better at setting the tone. I see. I have, uh, I have one gal on my Facebook page that's been there for several years. She's not from America. Forget her name. But she makes it a point to literally, literally never ever, she's married, never pursue him even after being married. So in other words, he always has to be the one to initiate like you're describing and she just flat out won't do it. What do you think of that? That almost sounds fetishistic or something. <laughs> I know, I thought so too. <laughs> it's like, it's like a, I thought, well, I, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Whatever works for well, you. Well, that's, like that's a very old school hyper fit. You say she's not from America. I wonder if she's Eastern yeah. Eastern European because that's a very, sounds like a very yeah, Eastern you. European thing of, you know, the, the women don't pursue the men, the men, and the men yeah. do all the work, yeah. you know, that type of thing. And um, which I totally agree with <clears> the dating stage and the mating phase. I'm just thinking, God, for decades of being married, if I never reached out to my husband, that would be a little weird for me. I personally. think so too. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. And there's a lot of men that recognize when that dynamic's happening and they will kind of, in a passive aggressive way, just kind of fold their arms and say, all right, I'm not going to do anything yeah. for a week or two and let's see what happens. And yeah. they report back, she didn't look at me, she didn't kiss me, she didn't do nothing. This woman is just dead unless I do yeah. something. And that's a giant turnoff to a lot of guys. Okay, we're going to get to the last one, which is my favorite, because I've said <laughs> this ad nauseum. I think you and I talked about it when I was on your show, and it is so, so, so important. I feel really strongly about it. Can you tell from my excitement? Yes. Step five, get her away from the kids. Yes. I, I, can, I can certainly say this from personal experience, that um, it is going back to what we were saying about when I said what changes this to begin with is kids and mothers respond differently to children than fathers do and their attachment is is greater it's stronger and it's very difficult for them to disassociate and yes. whenever they're in their midst and I can speak to this even like right now we have a, a 21 year old and an 18 year old she's here, she's here for a couple of weeks but our son has just graduated from um, high school so I have 21 and 18 year old it's like having roommates right I can't like turn into this sex thing when I've got these grown people right next to me. So that's for that for that two week period. That's not really happen. <laughs> if you wanted it to during that two week period, you'd probably have to remove me. Um, it's very hard when they're that out. It's much easier, in my opinion, when they're babies um, and toddlers even. But but anyway, putting me aside, it's just any time I've been in in a hotel or, or out of town with my husband, I mean, it's immediate. Within hours, I go back into that mode that I was pre-kid, which is not to say every woman will, because some women are so overly attached, they cannot detach. So I, I wanna recognize that and not say that's always gonna work for everybody. Um, but that means that you have kind of an issue there that you gotta deal with, that you yeah. can't with your children. That's like a whole nother maybe podcast. But in general, getting her away from the kids and putting her back into that sex woman place is a win-win. Yes. Parenthood is the antithesis of sexuality. The two do not mix. They're no. po polar opposites. And so when the wife is, you know, I use the example in the book when she's swiffering or mopping up, you know, kid mess number 97 in the kitchen and she's bent over and the man reaches and this is like man one on one. A lot of men do this reach over and squeeze the wife's boob or smack her on the butt. And she's like, Can you please not right now? And the man's just taken aback, like, geez, wow, what the hell? Just playing around. Gosh, it's like, no, because you're trying to. She's in this, my God, I've just cleaned this thing 97th time. These stupid kids, I'm in an angry mode. And here comes man trying to just, he doesn't recognize the situation. He's just completely clueless. There's no emotional intelligence involved. He's just all about, I see something and I want it. And he goes for it and just, it's insulting to the woman. It's, she, reckon, she realizes he just doesn't recognize what's going on. It's just all and around a bad thing. You think of him, sorry, as being one more chore. Yes, you don't want. Yeah. exactly, exactly. It's just another stressor in an already stressed situation. That's like an extreme example, but it also could just be you're just having a, a wonderful good time with the kiddos, reading bedtime stories and stuff. That's also a very non-sexual thing. There's really no way to to mix the two worlds. So what better way than to, yeah, escape. And, but you're getting to a big thing here, whereas a lot of women are so attached to their kids that it's almost impossible for them to detach and go into that sexual mindset where they will put up every 
roadblock imaginable. The man, the man may say, I've got a weekend planned. I've, the kids are getting taken care of. Don't worry about Billy going to his practice. I mean, I got everything. And she's like, oh, oh yeah, well, what about this? Taken care of. What about that? Taken care of. And she'll just, well, I don't feel comfortable leaving the kids with aunt so-and-so. It's like, <sighs> well, wouldn't you say that that, I mean, you can almost do this as a test. I would think if you were married to, 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 to sort of take your temperature, take your marriage's yeah. temperature. Yeah. There is a thing. Because um, if you, if you don't react to excitement from that, that's kind of scary. It is. That that means you've really disconnected. Yeah. And that's when it's time for it. Look, <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying my best here as your husband. I, I, I get a sense that we're disconnected. We haven't even been on a date for so many X months, years. But, and that is not healthy. I don't care how you cut it. I'm trying to do so. Are you trying to tell me that wife, as far as you're concerned, that's not us anymore? There's no room for that anymore? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Because if so, that's not good. That's not sustainable. I don't care. And you could ask any marriage counselor and they'll tell you the same thing. In fact, yeah. there was a time when back before divorce was now as easy to get as it is, where that was le legit grounds for divorce. Yeah. Not yeah. having sex with your always hot time yeah. with the, back then anyway, the husband. So, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I, I agree with you that it is, it's way bigger than I realized. Way, way. I mean, I, I've been so focused on this, you know, masculine feminine dynamic for a couple of years, but in the last, I'd say six to eight months, I've really been sort of walloped with the reality of, of how sexless marriages, how much sexless marriages um, are a thing. And I, and I do want to, I do, I, I think it's important to point out that, you know, this, at least this is my opinion, you might have a different opinion. It, it's, there's no hard and fast rule for how much sex is, you know, um, there's no right or wrong to how much sex if both people are good with whatever's going on. Exactly. You know, you know so, so I, I, you know, and people's circumstances are different. It's, it's going to be a lot different when you have four children under four, for example, right? I never had that scenario, but <laughs> that's pretty extreme to two children who are eight and 10. Yeah. So depending on where you are in the stage of things, you got to kind of um, calibrate what we're talking about with whatever your circumstances are. At the end of the day, if you're on the same page, it's good whatever that may be, like what works for you isn't going to work for me and vice versa. Um, it's really just when somebody, when it's really, really gone bad, it's, it's really obvious because someone's really unhappy, mm -hmm. typically one of the partners, usually the man, but not always. Um, and, and there's a way to, um, it, you know, if you're not addressing it, it's, it, it's only going to go south. There's yeah. nowhere to go, but down. And there's an interesting left turn to all of this that a lot of men experience which I experienced, which was, wow, there was that energy was lurking in there with my wife, who I thought maybe was asexual. I thought whatever it may be that she had hormonal issues. And it turns out, wow, that energy is in there. And uh, a lot of men will not to be too crass will discover um, sex toys, things like that. The, the wife, yeah. the wife is hidden away in the drawer, hoping that he never oh, sees. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> or that, wow, I looked at my wife's Kindle and she has 97 different uh, romance novels that, <laughs> that, are, that, that are really filthy. And so there's yeah. obviously something there all the way to the most extreme, which is I've discovered that she's been carrying on with somebody else. Yeah. Um, so for not every situation, obviously, some people are genuinely do have hormonal issues. They genuinely do have issues with depression and so forth. Um, but I, from my personal anecdotal experience, the majority of people I can safely say, dude, the energy's in there. You just have to know how to pull it out. And yes, a lot of that is on her, but a lot of that's on you too. And the only thing you can control is you. So give it a shot, see what happens. And that's the whole crux of the book right there. Well, I think that's a fabulous ending to this conversation, Ralph. And I really appreciate your coming on. Yes, people thank you for having me. This. Thank I suspect you. Suspect I'll hear from people on this and say, "Who is that guy?" <laughs> so I hope they all. I'm um, telling them again exactly how to get with you in case they didn't hear it earlier. Yeah, check it out, DadStartingOver.com. And for all you men that are listening that are interested in the group that I mentioned, the DSO fraternity, we have a special um, page set up on the website. And you can go to DadStartingOver.com/slash/venker. V-E-N-K-E-R slash Venker. And we have a special deal set up where you can try out the uh, DSO fraternity, which is normally fourteen ninety nine a month. You can try it out for one month for a dollar. So for one dollar, you give it a shot. And after the end of the month, you say, I don't think this is for me. You're out of buck. No big deal. 
Uh, but it, if it is for you, great. You can join. We're averaging, uh, we're, we're signing up uh, 50, 60 new guys every month. Um, it's growing. We have guys from all over the world, a lot from Australia, South Africa, Europe, um, the U.S. and Canada are still our main two. And, oh, I didn't mention that we um, just translated the Dead Bedroom Fix into French as well as Spanish. And the Spanish just oh, went wow. up. Oh, wow. Awesome. Yeah, Spanish just went up for sale today. So that opens up to a whole new market there. So that's pretty and those, cool. And those countries you named were like, that's exactly when I looked at the analytics. That's basically mine. Which yeah. must be why we had this overlap where people told English me speaking. Me. English speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Ralph. This has been really fun. Thank so you so much. I appreciate it. You take care. All righty. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that ends this hour of The Suzanne Venker Show. Don't forget to continue the conversation on Facebook by typing in the Facebook search bar, The Suzanne Venker Show. Also, please recommend this podcast to one friend you think would enjoy it. And don't forget to leave us a review on whatever platform you're now using. Finally, if you have a question or comment for me, you can email me at Suzanne at the Suzanne Venker Show.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week. 